Did Donald Trump make the right call on Venezuela? The U.S. president leading the way among the Lima group of North and Latin American nations that have uh, decided, 11 of them, to recognize Parliament Speaker Juan Guaido as acting president. A 35-year-old emerging as the face of the opposition, swearing himself in uh, on a copy of the Bolivarian Constitution. That Constitution states that the Speaker's next in line if the President's out. But don't count out either Nicolas Maduro. In the nearly six years since he took over from the late Hugo Chavez, Venezuela's leader has beaten down all comers. And despite this week's failed mutiny at a National Guard barracks outside Caracas, Maduro still enjoys the support of Army Brass. We'll hear from his defense minister, which brings us back to the international community. Faced with the implosion of democracy, a meltdown of the economy that's forced a whopping 2.4 million Venezuelans to flee, are those foreign powers uh, backing, nonetheless, coercive regime change? Or, uh, as critics of U.S. policy in the region call it, is it a coup? Uh, are EU nations right in taking uh, a more cautious stance? Or does that make those European nations complicit in the humanitarian disaster that's unfolding inside this oil-rich giant? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking, well, who's the president of Venezuela? And joining us is uh, writer uh, Vicente Ulive, author of I Killed Simon Bolivar. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, we want to welcome as well Venezuelan commentator Gustavo Rincon. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, from Washington, Ana Quintana senior policy analyst uh, for Latin America and the Western Hemisphere at uh, the Heritage Foundation Think Tank. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. And Gregory Wilpert, managing editor of The Real News Network, the author of Changing Venezuela by Taking Power, the History and Policies of the Chavez Government. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, hashtag F24debate. 24 hours on international reactions, still pouring in to the U.S., but also the likes of uh, Canada, Brazil, Colombia, and more. Recognize Juan Guaido as acting president of Venezuela. Uh, the the uh, U.S. president in a tweet on uh, Wednesday uh, calling it the illegitimate Maduro regime. At what point do you actively push for regime change inside of a sovereign state? Selena Sykes takes a look at some of the international reactions. After being backed by Washington, Venezuela's opposition leader Juan Guaido has won support from most of South America. Eleven members of the region's Lima group, including Brazil, Colombia, Argentina and Canada, recognize Guaido as the country's legitimate president. After his declaration on Wednesday during mass protests in Venezuela and several other Latin American countries. The United Nations called for more talks to avoid the political crisis spiraling out of control. What we hope is that uh, dialogue can be possible and that we avoid an escalation that could lead to the kind of conflict that would be a total disaster for Venezuela and for the Venezuelan people and for the region. Brussels and European nations also stopped short of recognizing Guaido, instead calling for new elections. Things happened yesterday and we have to keep working in the European Union to see what we do. But it is obvious that there will be contact with the Venezuelan regime. Do you think this can be done ignoring the reality? The reality is what it is and we must work with it. A message that was echoed by French President Emmanuel Macron who called Maduro's re-election illegitimate and praised the courage of Venezuelans who had taken to the streets. A number of key allies are still backing Nicolas Maduro. In South America, these include Uruguay and Mexico, who are calling for more talks between the government and the opposition. Elsewhere, Russia warns the US against military intervention in Venezuela and said the attempted power grab was a violation of the basics and principles of international law. A similar line was taken by Turkey and China, with Beijing saying it opposes international interference in Venezuelan politics. China supports the Venezuelan government's efforts to safeguard national sovereignty and stability. China always upholds the principles of non-interference in other nations' internal affairs and opposes external intervention in Venezuela. The EU is hoping to set up an international contact group with South American nations in February, 
that would seek talks between Maduro and the opposition. Vicente Olive, uh, in that report, we saw that tweet from the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron calling uh, Maduro illegitimate. Nonetheless, he stops shy of uh, recognizing uh, Juan Gadillo as the acting president of Venezuela. He doesn't go as far as the U.S. Yes, absolutely. There are two different things. Um, Maduro is completely an illegitimate president because he was elected in 2018 through an election that had no international observers, where there was no opposition parties that were inscribed, except one of the opposition party that came from Chavismo, which was Henry Falcón. We had uh, instances of uh, voter fraud, and uh, even the people that organized the election say they couldn't account for the result. So that was an illegitimate election made in May instead of December, because he knew in December people would not vote for him. So yes, he's a completely illegitimate uh, president. And your reaction to the fact that you have, on the one hand, the Spaniards, the French, the European Union with one reaction, which is cautious, mm -hmm. and the other we've just seen uh, in the last couple of hours, the uh, UK Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, saying the United Kingdom believes Juan Gadillo is the right person to take Venezuela forward. We're supporting the US, Canada, Brazil, and Argentina to make that happen. Not the same position. Not at all. I think it's well pretty much shameful that some countries do take these steps when we have noted cases of human rights abuse that have been chronicled by different... Uh, so France and Spain should go further. Uh, maybe not further, but at least the other ones that are, that are on the tepid kind of side should establish that Maduro has to, you know, be dealt with in a certain in a certain way through elections is what I'm expecting in the in the internal Venezuelan point of view. But uh, but just saying that you don't know that you want dialogue. We've had dialogues before between the opposition and the government in 2014 and 2017. These led nowhere if it weren't for people getting jailed. So dialogue is not the the route to be taken here, in my opinion. Gustavo Rincon. Uh Emmanuel Macron's position, does it go not far enough, too far? I think, uh, no, the Emmanuel Macron position is, uh, you can explain that position about uh, the situation in France. I think the, the, he have some enough problem in France to start to have, uh, to have um, a speech against uh, Again, uh, left uh, wind in Venezuela. I think is, is for that reason. Has that to do more with domestic politics. I, I'm saying. pretty sure that Gilles Jean are more likely the, the reason that Macron can can talk a lot about, about Venezuela. But about uh, the all the all, all the things you say, uh, Vicente. I think you go very quick about all the situation in in Venezuela. Uh, the last year. We have elec election in Venezuela. We have an, 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 a party for opposition yeah. that go to that ele election. That's, that's just what I said. They were illegitimate elections with no international observers, where even the people that organized the election say they couldn't account for the results, where all the opposition parties, most of them were in jail. They were in exile. People were thrown in jail. These are realities. I'm not saying it. You can look up the NGOs, like uh, no. Amnesty International, Human but Rights Watch, no. World Open International. I, 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 that's I, I, a reality. I understand what you say, but yeah. you are mixing facts. Because, yes... You think the election was legitimate? You think Maduro was legitimately elected in a free and fair election where parties could... I can could, say that. Could, could, I can uh, say that. But, of course you can. But, but you, you, you can do... You I can can't either. The, the opposite. Ever. Uh, excuse me? You can do the, the opposite. What's What's the opposite? not possible that the that the election was illegitimate. That's it's just not. what you said. You just said the election was illegitimate. You can't say it's legitimate. No, I, I'm absurd. The, the situation and and the legal the legal situation of the government is very very troubled. The elections were supposed to have place in December, not in May. Yes. How is it legal to have the election in May? The that, that terms. Huh? The position goes to that ele election. Of course not. That's yours. No. Yes, not true. They no. did. No. They did. No, they did not. They did. Henry Falcon was not part of the opposition. The opposition abstained. For the, for the reason that I'm just mentioning. You don't have international observers. How can you have an election when you don't have international observers? You can't account for the voting fraud that was registered. No, I, I, I can't. I'm stating facts. I can you accept, can believe whatever I, you want. I can accept the, you mix okay. that about, uh, with, uh, uh, with persons that are in jail and with other, other things that, that, that happen in Venezuela. Look, mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to support Maduro right now. But I think it, your speech, Monk, Misses. Misses. Misses what? Miss, miss the point of view of the poor people of Venezuela, of the Chavista. 
You know why Maduro is in the power? Yeah, is Maduro the power. legitimate or is he illegitimate? That's what we're discussing. Not uh, the view uh, of the and the other president Venezuela. is legitimate. Let, let, let's go back to the issue of, of, the interna of the international reactions. And I want to pick up on something that Gustavo Rincon just said, which is uh, there's an element of domestic politics when we look at it from here in Paris. The French far left up in arms. It's parliamentary leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon firing off a series of tweets saying, not in our name, because of, for Macron, a democratic election is, quote, illegitimate and a far-right coup d'etat supported by Trump and Bolsonaro restores democracy, enough is enough. Ana Quintana, uh, is Donald Trump's and uh, Canada and the other Lima Group nations that are with them supporting a coup d'etat? I think we need to establish a few baseline facts here. This is not an ideological issue. This is not a U.S. interventionism issue. This is a good versus evil issue, right? So I think let's just talk about that from the just from the onset. And I think the point that was being raised earlier about is Maduro an illegitimate leader? Yes, he is. He is absolutely an illegitimate leader. As of January 10th, when he was supposed to take, when he took office, over 50 nations declared him to be an illegitimate leader. So this is not this a grand conspiracy against him. There is an international consensus, a wide variety of countries across the ideological spectrum that recognize that he is a danger to his country, he is a danger to his people, and the return of democracy needs to return, the democracy needs to return to Venezuela. This is not a coup by any shape or form. Not, not a coup. Nonetheless, uh, you're getting the sense the U.S. is tightening the screws, what with talk of uh, further sanctions, particularly uh, in the oil sector, of trying to funnel the money from oil revenues to uh, Juan Gadillo. Uh, in, in effect, um, it's uh, trying to change the destiny of a sovereign nation. So the oil, Venezuela ceased to be a sovereign nation the moment that this narco dictatorship took it over. And that's, and that's an unfortunate fact. The government of Venezuela is a criminal government. The oil industry, PDVSA, the national oil company, is it's essentially a slush fund of the military. Maduro handed it over to Padrino and to the rest of the army, to his cronies in the army, as a way of buying off their loyalty and ensuring that they would stay loyal to him, right? That the upper echelons of the military would continue to have Maduro's back. And that's what they've done. And if you look at oil output, I mean, the Venezuelan economy is not in the tanks because of the international community or because of the targeted sanctions, the human rights-based sanctions, as a matter of fact. Um, it's not as it's not a result. It's a result of their own ineptitude and their own corruption. I mean, you have the vice president of Venezuela, who's a designated drug trafficking kingpin for working with Mexican drug cartels. You have over a hundred Mexican government, I mean, Venezuelan government officials rather, who've been designated as who've been sanctioned by the U.S. government and other governments as well for human rights abuses and various forms of corruption. Mm. I mean, the evidence is clearly there. All right, Gregory Wilpert, we've, we're having lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Uh, one uh, viewer saying people can say what they want about Trump, but he just helped one of the poorest, most dangerous countries in the world mm -hmm. to have an opportunity to get back on their feet after terrible Maduro leadership. Your thoughts? Well, there's so much to respond to. It's very difficult. I mean, first of all, uh, whether this is a coup or not, I mean, it's clear it's not yet a coup, but clearly the U.S. government is calling for a coup, and so is the opposition. They've openly told the, or asked the military to intervene to turn it uh, against Maduro, and if that if they were to do that, that would be a coup, and it would mean bloodshed. We have to be very clear about this: that anybody who's call, uh, saying that uh, they're against dialogue is in favor of bloodshed. Uh, that's the bottom line. No. I think that's yeah. just so irresponsible to say that there cannot and should not be dialogue. Uh, even the Pope and everybody else uh, who is in any way responsible uh, is saying that there has to be dialogue. And it's just, to me, it just seems absolutely unfathomable so somebody could say that they prefer uh, the military turning against Maduro. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing, about, of course, about the evidence that this is a narco state, and that's just complete nonsense. It's the only ones who have ever made that claim is the U.S. government, and they've never presented a shred of evidence about that. Now, I'm not saying that there is no corruption or that there is no involvement in drug trafficking uh -huh. in high levels of the government. That's certainly possible. But no evidence uh, concretely, one way or the other, has ever uh -huh. been presented.
The, uh, so you're saying that there is, I'm sorry, so you're saying that there is drug trafficking in the government, but you're saying that it's not a narco state. You're saying that the vice pre that the president's own stepsons, who are inside of a U.S. jail right now for attempting to sell drugs to an undercover DEA agent, is not evidence of the government, of high-level government involvement in drug trafficking? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I just want to be clear what's happening now. Yes, those are the stepsons. They're not okay. involved in high levels of government. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, it's... They were entrapped on top of it all. Okay. So, I mean, okay. So, the vice president said. working with, okay, no, no, I'm just, okay, it, let's just, I'll just have that out there. Okay. It doesn't, that's not proof that this is a narco state. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Vincente Olivier? Okay, okay, yes, that's perfect. Yes, I'd like, to, I'd like to just add that, yes, we've tried the dialogue attempt in the past, and, and for once, I, I do agree with Mr. Gregory Wilpert in the fact that the, there is a coup d'etat in Venezuela, and this coup d'etat took place in 2015 when Mr. Nicolas Maduro did not recognize the National Assembly that won legitimately the votes, and that's the person, Guaido, who is now in power. They stripped the National Assembly of its powers, they set up their own, poppy, uh, their own puppet assembly, and even the people that organized those elections, Smartmatic, said they couldn't account for the tally of votes that were given to that assembly. No. Those are the people that are ruling now. That is absolutely true. Those are the people that are ruling now instead of the National Assembly that was the last democratically elected government body in the country in 2015. After that, in 2017, was the Constituyente when, they had the, when we had this problem. And last year, with the election that we just proved is an illegitimate election. Gregory Wilpert? Well, there, there have been, he's right that there were uh, negotiations and they failed, but they failed because the U.S. government intervened in various times trying to sub torpedo those uh, negotiations. And it's one of the reasons, one of the main demands of the opposition was early elections. And uh, there was a very close agreement last year uh, where it almost happened, but then uh, in the last minute, uh, they fell apart for various reasons, and we have proof that there were meetings uh, with high-level high U.S. government officials, That, and after that, they canceled all the uh, agreement and refused to sign the final agreement, which had called for early elections. So um, if that had moved forward, that was, would have been an opportunity to prevent what is happening today. But it didn't happen mainly because the U.S. government uh, and many other people in the radical right-wing opposition don't want uh, real elections because mm -hmm. they, they want a complete break with the current government, and that will only happen if there's a coup. Right. Neither, neither do the Chinese imperialists who have taken over PDVSA and basically control our petrol, our petrol production and take 300,000 barrels a day. The Chinese imperialists, you never talk about, strangely. All the money that we're losing that we're giving to China, that you don't care about. But as soon as the U.S. has a dialogue with somebody from the opposition, we have to go after the boogeyman and its international intervention. What do you think about China? Well, the, the Venezuelan government is repaying its loans to China. There's nothing uh, particularly strange about that. Right. They, uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the Venezuela can only get loans practically from China or, uh, at the moment because right. uh, the yeah. U.S. has prevented uh, through international institutions, through the IMF, from, uh, from Venezuela from accessing any kind of international credit lines. All right, gentlemen, we're going to pick up on these points. Gem ladies and gentlemen, excuse me. When we come back, <laughs> stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Hi, I'm Kalki. We are uh, at Bombay and we are going to go and discover my career in Bollywood on France 24. This week, Valérie Fayol takes us to Mumbai. Our guest is a French actress based in India, the only one to make her mark on Bollywood. Kalki takes us on a stroll through the streets and museum corridors of India's biggest and wealthiest city before embarking on a musical journey with film composer Naren Chandavarka. Don't miss this special program on France 24 and France24.com. The world is ever-changing. The news doesn't wait. That's why at France 24, we'll always be there to help make sense of world events. For the best international coverage, 24 hours a day, no matter what. France 24, with you everywhere all the time. My name is Osama Aslusi and I'm the Algiers correspondent for France 24. I bring you the latest news and stories from here, the capital Algiers and beyond. You can watch me here on France 24 and also online at france24.com. Usama Sanusi, one of the 200 France 24 correspondents around the world. 
Welcome back. Before we resume the France 24 debate, some of the stories we're following for you in the newsroom. The first peaceful transition of power in Congo's history, Felix Chisichetti sworn in after an election marred by fraud, the successor to Joseph Kabila, reaching out in his inaugural address to the opposition. Carlos Ghosn officially out. Renault unveils a two-headed management team which promises a governance overhaul at the French auto giant. Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire tells France 24 he's hoping for a strengthening of the alliance with Nissan and Mitsubishi. You'll hear his conversation with our own Stephen Carroll. A yellow vest slate of candidates for next May's European elections here in France. While it's too early to estimate how representative of the movement they are, one poll already suggests the list could be in third place ahead of most of the mainstream parties. As Yemen's warring parties accuse each other of violating a truce agreement, we'll be telling you about 24 hours in the life of a family caught in the middle in the flashpoint port city of Hodeida. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 uh, debate and what could be a watershed moment, what with uh, the uh, US and uh, many of its regional allies uh, de declaring that uh, they recognize the Speaker of Parliament, Juan Guaido in Venezuela, as the acting president taking uh, the standoff with the government of Nicolas Maduro uh, a step further. With us to talk about a Venezuelan writer, Vincente Oliva, the author of I Killed Simon Bolivar. We're also with uh, Venezuelan commentator uh, Gustavo Rincon. Uh, from uh, Washington, Ana Quintana, senior policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, think Tank, and welcome back as well to Gregory Wilpert, managing editor of the Real News Network, author of Changing Venezuela by Taking Power, the History and Policies of the Chavez uh, Government. Um, one question about the standoff with Washington, Ana Quintana. Uh, Nicolas Maduro has given uh, U.S. diplomatic personnel 72 hours to leave the country. The U.S. State Department says it's not going to comply with the order. What's going to happen? Well, I mean, frankly, Maduro is not the legitimate leader, so the U.S. State Department should not be accepting orders from him, right? Um, the interim president has stated that all diplomatic personnel are welcome there uh, and are welcome to maintain their diplomatic representation there. And I think this is a moment where the Venezuelan, where the Maduro, uh, Maduro and his officials need to recognize what do they want to happen to their officials inside of Washington, D.C.? Do they also want to be sent back? I mean, I'm pretty sure they don't want to live in Venezuela right now, and I'm sure they enjoy their lives inside of Washington, D.C. And also, I think, you know, for those uh, wondering or are concerned about the safety of our diplomats, I think Maduro would have to be, frankly, borderline suicidal to do anything to diplomats under the administration of President Trump. I mean, let's be frank, right? We saw how the administration responded to the health attacks against the Cuba, the diplomats inside of Cuba. I mean, we know that the administration is going to respond even stronger if anything were to happen to U.S. diplomats in Caracas. Gregory Wilpert, how do you see it unfolding, that, that standoff uh, with the U.S. refusing uh, to evacuate its diplomats from, uh, from the Venezuelan capital? Well, first of I think it's unheard of in the history of the world that uh, diplomats that would be allowed to stay in a country that uh, they've been expelled from, no matter who is the government that, uh, that the U.S. recognizes. But uh, the other thing is, of course, I mean, there's no question that they're safe. Uh, they can have a, you know, a security mm -hmm. detail of 100 people and will be escorted to the airport. Uh, and um, I'm sure they'll be completely, perfectly safe. There's no, no reason to be concerned for their safety. Um, however, the government, uh, regardless of who the U.S. thinks is president, has the right uh, to, to expel them and, and will probably expel them from the country um, under complete safety uh, procedures. So there's no, no concern there. Of course, the question is, how will the U.S. react to that? And they'll probably expel the Venezuelan diplomats uh, from the United States. That's perfectly normal. And that, I'm sure they're completely ready uh, for that eventuality. In Venezuela this Thursday, we heard this warning by the defense minister saying an attempted coup is afoot. 
I warn the people of Venezuela of this very dangerous claim. It's dangerous for our integrity and our social peace. I warn the people of Venezuela that a coup d'etat is coming against our institutions, against our democracy, against our constitution, and against President Nicolas Maduro, the legitimate president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. What's your reaction? How is it going to unfold? Uh, well, uh, first of all, again, uh, I completely agree with Ms. Padrino Lopez. There was a coup d'etat, and it happened in 2015, when uh, Nicolás Maduro did not recognize the legitimately elected uh, National Assembly. The way, the best way that this could unfold is the, the blueprint that Mr. Guaidó has uh, that is calling elections uh, within a month, pardoning people that have worked for the regime that accept those that committed humanitarian crisis, uh, humanitarian uh, attacks, and uh, letting in the humanitarian aid. That would be the best issue for everybody, and it implies no violence. Now, that's the, the best case scenario. The worst case scenario would be uh, maybe the government or Maduro himself taking a hardline dictatorship approach and just encroaching into power. We don't know enough to know where this is going to go, but it's anywhere in the middle. Be, 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 be honest here, Vincent, yep. because we're hearing a lot of speculation. Yes. We're inside the same week where there was an attempted mutiny yes. at a National Guard's barracks mm -hmm. outside of Caracas. How actively is the outside world rooting for the rank and file of soldiers to rise up against uh, the top brass. Yeah, well, uh, actually, that's the only... The, the play here by the opposition is exactly that. We've tried to do this before. In 2014 and 2017, it was the same. Try to get the military to, to bring us to elections. So uh, the idea here is actually giving them uh, a free pass and saying, hey, if you're not with Maduro, then no, nothing's going to happen to you. So you can back a transition. So the idea here is that if people can... If the military can, can, can just flip en masse, then that could bring a transition because what's happened before is that they've done it one by one and they've all been put into jail. So uh, that would be also a possibility, but, but the, the international community, the importance of it is telling uh, the military that they can, that it's okay to recognize Guaido and call for elections. Gustavo Rincon? Yes. Uh, I think truly here we have only two, two possibilities. Uh, first one is that uh, like every time in that kind of situation on Venezuela, that uh, Guaido uh, stay uh, making some speeches and claiming uh, for months and months and just uh, the things uh, stay uh, that's like, a possibility uh, there yes. are absolutely the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the other the other option i think the peaceful option the, peace, the, the option I, I i believe and i want is to 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 start to make a dialogue to to speak again because you know the situation we've done that before you have to try again. Oh, okay. And the people that are in jail, yeah, like the the, like the leader went, of his right? party, Leopoldo oh, okay. Lopez, is right. under house arrest. Yes, uh, yes, but he wasn't for for dialogue. He, he, right. He's not. He's, he's in jail because he talked. No, it's not about that. Yeah, you but he's that. not the only person in jail. We have people that have been tortured. This is his you know, document. He's many people. So we tell yes, him to wait we for We have another lot of people dialogue? in jail, but uh, all the protests anti Maduro in the last year, you know that most, most part of the dead are military and policemen, not civil. Okay, that's another. Is, that's is, another, is true? Is what, another what, thing what I'm that, saying, that you agree about? No, it's not true. It's, it's normal not true. that no, no. if no, we had 140 no, people killed in 2017, they were not policemen and they were not officers. They were. We know who they were. Most, we documented no. it. M most part of them were were sorry right. that's, were that's not military and policemen. Okay, but why can't we have an election? You know to that so, Maduro. What do you want to talk the last about? thing that what Maduro wants want now about? is civilian dead. What do we? Because what are we going to because, talk about? Because Trump says very clearly, all options are in the table for for any violent situation. You know, if we have a 10, a 10, a 10, 10 kills in Caracas, right? You know that that it, it, it will be the end of Maduro, and uh, and he knows that, like Chavez. Oh, you know what, what Maduro knows. Great. No, it's just, you, you hear uh, the, the speech of, of Trump. Yeah, I mean... I'm he mean, he, 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 mean, he, I mean he, even a broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, as the tweet said, yes, I mean, Trump said something sensible for once. Hallelujah. But let's not focus on Trump. Let's focus really on the things that are happening, on the people that aren't getting yes. medicine, All right. aren't Trump's, getting food. Trump's uh, decision to, f uh, to weigh in is one thing that's changed the equation. The other, well, it's Juan Hadeo himself, unknown just a few weeks ago. Kathy Clifford takes a look at... <laughs> An unknown figure until just a few weeks ago. Now he's been thrust into the spotlight as the face of Venezuela's anti-Maduro movement. 
At 35 years old, Juan Guaido became the youngest ever president of the National Assembly. Since his election on January 5th, he's managed to get his opposition majority to officially denounce President Nicolas Maduro's re-election as fraud, a message he's hammering home on the streets. Just because Maduro has the sash, that makes him president? Just because Maduro has the symbol of power, it makes him a leader? That legitimacy comes from the ballot box, the people, their strengths, the streets, from the recognition and love of our people. Juan Guaido began his political career in 2007, amongst the crowds of students protesting against late President Hugo Chavez. Two years later, he was a founding member of the opposition Popular Will Party, then led by Leopoldo Lopez, who's since been imprisoned and then placed under house arrest. The former industrial engineer then returned to his home state of Vargas, where he was elected a deputy in 2015 at just 31 years old. Juan Guaido is now calling for a transitional government ahead of free and fair elections, saying he's willing to replace Maduro as interim president if he can gain the military's backing. For now, he can count on international support from the likes of the US, Brazil and the Organization of American States, which referred to him as Venezuela's acting president. Gregory Wilper, what do you make of uh, Juan Guaido? Well, I mean, it's, I mean, he's uh, certainly somebody who, who belongs to Venezuela's upper class. And so in that sense, he's not going to be accepted probably by the vast majority of Venezuelans. Uh, but um, We've had upper class presidents before, excuse me. Caldera governed twice and there wasn't richer than him. That's right. not an argument. <laughs> well... I still don't think that he's going to be accepted. He wasn't proper, properly elected, but uh, whatever. The, uh, the other thing is, of course, that uh, he lacks complete experience, of which is, of course, something that they've always accused Maduro of. OK, but fine. Um, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what to expect, uh, except that I think his course of action is, uh, like I said before, a very, very dangerous course of action, calling, basically calling for a military coup, which will lead to, uh, if it were to happen, would lead to bloodshed and violence. And therefore, I think that's absolutely unacceptable. I really hope that he changes course and uh, offers a dialogue with President Maduro, and, and which Maduro has already said he's open towards. Anna Quintana, you so agree? So you're too yes. Well, I'm just saying his two criticisms of Guaido are the same, are two defining factors of Maduro, somebody who's of the upper class and somebody who is not supported nor wide, nor was widely elected by the Venezuelan people. So right there, but that's a non-starter, right? We should put Maduro in a box and kind of put him to the side. I mean, it's an absolute fact. And so I think what we keep on talking about the only two options to kind of as the as the off ramps, we keep on talking about either the military option or either negotiations as the only off ramps for this current crisis. But those aren't the only current off ramps. Look, Maduro has already ransacked, pillaged and destroyed Venezuela. He's bled the country dry. His cronies have as well. Right now, he can literally get on a plane, he can get on a 747, go to Cuba, go to whatever country of his choosing, and spend the rest of his life, and that's it, and he's fine. And there can be a transitional government that's put in place. He can stop the bloodshed, he can stop the violence, he can stop it all. Right now is a very pivotal moment. Nobody's calling for a military coup, but I think now is a pivotal moment for the Venezuelan military, for the security forces, and for the, for the Venezuelan government writ large to recognize and to say, to sit back and take a self-reflecting moment and recognize, are they going to go, are they going to support as the leader, uh, the person who is an international pariah, who much of the Western Hemisphere does not recognize as a legitimate leader of Venezuela, or are they going to recognize the interim president who has said that he supports having elections and he supports a restructuring and a fixing of the economy? I mean, the, the choices are clear. Well, there, there's a whole bunch of things that are complete nonsense there. First of all, I mean, Maduro... Okay, also, please tell uh, me. I mean, yeah, yeah, please. He was elected in 2013 when running against Enrique Capriles, and the sure. election. Sure. So when he was appointed, so when he was when he was Chavez's handpicked successor, I mean that didn't give him the upper hand, right? And when they rigged the election against Capriles, that again didn't give him the upper hand. But please continue. Yeah. And uh, the election in 2018, the opposition boycotted. But we don't. We can argue about these points until we're blue in the face. That's not really the main sure. point. The main. There weren't international should... observers in the election. It was a sham right. election. How can you say yeah. that, Gregory? <laughs> I mean, argue. I mean, but look, one at a time, please. One at a time, Gregory. <laughs> the way out, and the and the only way out that makes sense is is a dialogue because clearly uh, Maduro th uh, believes and is convinced that he's the legitimately elected president. He's not going to resign. He's got had six million votes in the last election, six point two million votes. He's not going to give that up. 
uh, without um, a, a, a clear uh, alternative as to how to preserve the dignity and the, the project um, that, uh, that uh, he and Chavez uh, fought for. Sure. So look, I, I can convince myself that I'm Queen Elizabeth. That doesn't make me Queen Elizabeth, right? What we need to recognize <laughs> is that dialogues is that dialogues in Venezuela, the <laughs> Venezuelan government has consistently used dialogues as a stalling tactic, and they have never engaged in dialogues in good faith. They have not done so. Gre and Gre it's not been because of the U.S. government. It's been because of them. Gregory Wilpert, yeah. let me ask you, because uh, on Wednesday, when we saw those mass demonstrations, uh, our correspondent uh, saw with her own eyes um, people marching in areas that are normally loyal to the government. What does that tell you? Well, no doubt the Maduro government has lost a lot of popular support uh, because of the economic crisis. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I think actually if there were elections uh, between an opposition candidate and Maduro at this moment, um, Maduro would have a good chance of losing those elections. As a matter of fact, I even think that if the opposition had not boycotted the 2018 presidential election, he would have probably lost. Um, but uh, we don't know because the opposition does not want an election. Uh, they clearly have always wanted uh, a complete, um, you know, starting over with no one of Chavismo uh, remaining in any branch of uh, of, uh, of uh, government, uh, and basically wiping uh, Chavismo off the face of the earth. That's the that's been the main objective. That's the reason why they don't aren't interested in elections that that's are preposterous. Right no. mediated. But, it, but, but hang on, Gregory, it is the government who, faced with an opposition-controlled parliament, decided it wanted to change the constitution. Sorry? It is the government of Nicolas Maduro, when faced with an opposition-controlled parliament, that decided it wanted to change the constitution. Illegally. Yeah, they boycotted that election as well for the, uh, for the Constitutional Assembly. If they had participated there, I'm pretty sure that they would have won a majority as well. Um, what are but, you talking uh, about? Where is our National Assembly that we won by the votes in 2015? Where is Antonio Ledesma who won in 2007 when Chavez was still alive and was removed from power by Chavez? The opposition has won elections in the past, and every time they win, the person winds up in jail or the power is transferred to somebody else. So we can't take that route either. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that you stand here and you say that in 2017, we should have gone for the re recall referendum election, which was illegitimate to start with. We had the National Assembly. We don't need, we didn't want a recall referendum. And we got more votes than them in 2017. Even Smartmatic, which is the company that Maduro chose to count the votes, even they say the opposition had more votes and that they can't account for two million they votes. They organize the elections. How do you explain that? They were not involved in that election. They were not involved in that election. It was their machines, but they were not yes. involved. In it was the speech oh. about the Smartmatic. Smartmatic uh, uh, sell. The machine right, okay. sold the machine to, to the government, and because the unpopularity of Maduro, they right. have to to step aside and say, right. ah, we don't, right, right. we we weren't. So they, they didn't check the tallies either, because the smartmatic machines have tallies that you check. They were not checked, and the government cannot the account you say, for the you, you say that votes every time that they that have. Had, uh, someone from the opposition won an election, they go automatically to jail. Is it true? Because we had. I didn't say automatically. All right. Before we say the assembly is. Uh, I don't know, 80%? I, I told you, I told you, we've seen Ledesma, the assembly doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It has no reason? power. For which reason? Antonio because, Ledesma Because the tri tribunal annullified from... it like the dictatorships do. Look, look, open your eyes. It's a dictatorship. Dictatorships annullify the, the National Assembly like Fujimori did. They take the, the tribunal, they pack it with court judges, and they put people in jail. What more do you want? There's G NGOs that recognize this. Right, I mean, we, come on. We can, what we can agree on is, is, is the fact that uh, the economy... Uh, in Venezuela has triggered what the United Nations lists as the world's worst refugee crisis with hyperinflation out of control. 2.4 million citizens have fled Venezuela in the past four years, most for neighboring states. Before, you could have a good savings plan. You had money for that. Now, you can buy five or six things and after that you don't have anything left. Forget shoes, forget t-shirts, forget underwear, forget it all. We don't have enough money for practically anything. But what's dangerous is to stay here with the child that coughs. That's a flu and can take antibiotics because there aren't any. What's dangerous is to stay here with a fracture, to go around 20 hospitals with no one able to help you. It's more dangerous to stay here, to go looking for money or bread, than to go on the road. So Anna Quintana, um, 
actively pushing for regime change, uh, is that going to, in the short term, help Venezuela or, as Gustavo Rincon was, was fearing, uh, stir bloodshed and even more hardship? We need to stop looking at this as though there are two binary options. What's happening right now is you have the international community, much of Latin America, and a growing list of countries that do not recognize Nicolas Maduro as president, right? Nobody is directly pushing for regime change. What they are asking for is for there to be a democratic transition. Nicolas Maduro can agree to elections. Maduro can agree to step down and, uh, and let the interim president take over. There's a lot of there's there's a process there's a mul there's multiple processes in place that Nicolas Maduro can agree to but the fact of the matter is that Nicolas Maduro and his predecessor Hugo Chavez have demonstrated they do not care about their country and they don't care about their people they just do not care Gregory Wilpert well, it's just, again, I mean, the fact that the Maduro uh, government and also before that, uh, President Chavez contributed to the biggest decline in inequality. And now, of course, this much of this has been reversed. How do you uh, measure inequality? I'm sorry, I'm curious. How do you measure inequality? Um, it, it shows that they definitely do care about uh, about the people of Venezuela. And, of course, uh, now we can argue about the individual policies. That was 10 years ago, by the way. But uh, I know that but, exactly. I'm just I'm curious as to how he measures that, inequality. That like they, how specifically yeah. are you measuring this? Because I'm measuring 50,000 Venezuelans fleeing the country every day. I'm looking but, at the last that, time that I was in Colombia, every that, child that came up to me was a Venezuelan panhandler. I said that it has been reversed the last couple of years because of the economic crisis and the economic crisis can be uh, attributed to ma two main factors. One is the uh, the government's own mistakes in handling the economy, and the other is uh, the uh, the inter the oil price and the oh, sorry three factors, and the other is the the uh, sanctions against Venezuela. Um, but uh, there's uh, and it's true. The that sanctions there are, are targeted sanctions against corrupt government Venezuelan government officials. Africa. The sanctions are not against the government. Because, uh, they, they uh, are returning to their home countries. Really, Venezuela has been uh, harboring or has been welcoming. Uh, Four million uh, Colombians, for example, many of them are, you know, have decided to return to Colombia. So it's not only Venezuelans who are leaving Venezuela. So you're saying uh, that the refugee crisis right now is Colombians that are returning back home? A large chunk, about half of them are estimated. A large to chunk. And let me tell you, shame on you, because right now there are literally children that are starving and dying. There are families that are being ripped apart and separated I, because of this I, refugee I, I, crisis. I, and you're I, claiming that it's just Colombians returning back home. I That's absolutely that. factually inaccurate. I, we're going to we're going to have to unfortunately leave it there because we're running short on time. But I want to thank you uh, so much, uh, Gregory Wilpert and Anna Quintana, for being with us uh, from Washington, D.C., Vicente Olive, uh, Gustavo Rincon. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Nicholas Rushworth. Hi to you, Francois. Hi, everybody. Hello. And El Presidente, uh, not Hugo Chavez, but Nicolas Maduro, has uh, been tweeting in the last few hours. He tweets regularly in Spanish, French, other languages, and English. We can go to his latest tweet, which is uh, determined in that Bolivarian style. We will not accept any empire imposing governments on us by extra constitutional means. In Venezuela, respect for the will of the people, the constitution and sovereignty will reign. We shall prevail, is what he's saying. So two presidents, deadlock, um, chaos, we've seen before, of course, in Venezuela. He has two hashtags um, for his uh, point of view. He has hashtag we are Maduro and hashtag Yankee go home. And there you can see some of the people tweeting saying, I voted for him. Um, he's in the constitutional right, of course. So um, one of the supporters outside Venezuela is Vladimir Putin. Um, Bloomberg um, has a, an opinion piece here saying, uh, in terms of that geopolitical aspect of this, mm. um, uh, Putin is basically uh, has to is in, in his in his bid to um, attack the USA and other Western countries. He has to stick by Maduro um, simply for the, the the fact that tens of billions of dollars are invested if uh, the country goes down the tubes with Maduro in charge and a U.S. Uh, uh, led uh, uh, regime comes in or a U.S. Um, backed regime comes in, then that will, there will be a direct cost for him. So um, the, the 
the, um, the, the, there he's saying um, the, the government is, has got a strong support from Turkey as well and other countries. So we've been seeing countries that are backing um, Guaido. Um, the front pages of the uh, regional press tell the story. Uh, there we've got the Argentinian front page, La Voz. Two presidents, political tension increasing. We've got La Razón in Mexico saying Mexico and Uruguay are uh, pushing for dialogue here um, as the opposition in Venezuela go for a frontal shock with uh, um, Maduro. And here, uh, like the Colombian people, por la democracia, uh, so backing Guaido. Um, so there are countries who are favor in the region and globally there are also countries that are actually supporting Maduro. Um, just in terms of Guaido himself, his tweet page is literally um, the, 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 the support he's getting. So here we've got um, uh, Luis Alberto Moreno, who is the uh, president of the Inter-American Bank in South America. We've got Maurizio Macri there. Um, the president tweeting his support. We've got the Canadian Forest Minister, Christia Freeland. So he's just basically sending out his support uh, mm. for um, himself and what he's doing. So two presidents, what we've got in terms of the media is an erosion in terms of censorship. There is very little uh, anti-Maduro um, publications out there. We do have... But that ends, that's where social media comes in. Well, indeed, exactly, which is where it's being fought, um, this battle now. But um, El Nacional has, um, is still going. It stopped its print runs in exactly. December. Yes. Uh, now it's only online, only paper shortages prevent them. And there you can see inflation at, what is it, over 1 million percent. Um, and then you have the poor Venezuelan who is saying, I live on minimum wage, which is impossible, of course. Yes. Um, so a horror story. The tragedy of Venezuela has been going on for years and now perhaps reached ahead. We shall see. Many thanks uh, for that, Nicholas Rushworth. I want to thank uh, our panelists once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.